Mix in the Dark. Hey, what's up? It's Mai Yang from Mix in the Dark. If you think this episode title sounds familiar, that's because it is. Last year, I collaborated with Lingva and Tales from the Abyss to tell this three-part story. I had a few listeners who wanted me to retell it in its entirety. I also had some listeners who couldn't find the three parts, so... That's what this extra episode is for. It's just to put the parts together so that you could hear it all together. If you haven't figured it out, this is a personal story. Some of the parts are rearranged for storytelling purposes so that it would make sense for you. And because I was a 10-year-old girl at the time, I asked my siblings and parents for a lot of help. This is a pretty sad story, but I do hope that you enjoy it. Rest in peace to my brother-in-law and grandma. We miss you. Please enjoy. This story begins with a house. My older sister's house, to be exact. My whole family calls her Pana. Her husband and their little family decided to move to a house in Forest Lake, Minnesota. Their little family included her two sons and two brother-in-laws. Before I start, I want to explain that this event took place a long time ago when I was still young. I put together the story based on my memories of being at the house and what I was told by my family members when I was still young. It might be a bit off in the timeline, but it is a true story. Pana and her family moved into their new house on a very damp and cloudy day. We decided to pay a visit. I remember it was springtime. The ground was still wet from the morning rain, and fog formed from the morning heat. I was still in grade school at the time. I remember going room to room with my sisters to check out the space. The house was huge. It had six rooms, two bathrooms, and a huge yard, and, not to mention, acres of land. The place was pretty secluded, too. The neighbors on all sides were probably a good few blocks out. We walked to the backyard and found that they even had a pool and playground set. I already decided in my mind that this was going to be my hangout spot on the weekends. Pana's family lived in the house for a couple of months and made it their own. All of the family members in the house worked to pay the mortgage. Pana had a brother-in-law that lived with them named Va. I called him Tzilao Va. He was usually around the house helping with chores and whatnot. I saw him as an older brother because he was younger, probably around his 20s. One weekend, I remembered Zilova took a weekend trip to go canoeing and fishing with the boys in the family. I came over to babysit the two little nephews with my older sister, Lily, and younger sister, Sarah. I remember that I was excited not to watch the boys, but to go for a swim in their pool. My nephews were probably four and five years old at the time, so we took turns sitting by the staircase to watch them. The pool wasn't really ready to swim in yet, but we decided on swimming anyway. In Forest Lake, the waters don't have the same type of chemical contents as in the cities, so its water was this mucky, light brownish looking color when it was in the pool. The chlorine didn't help turn it into a nice blue color like you would see in regular pools either. If you stepped inside the pool and walked until the water got to your waist, you wouldn't be able to see below your knees. We weren't allowed to go past the four feet mark. Pana even put a long rope along the middle to mark the area where we couldn't enter. I remember my brother-in-laws came back home and it was our last day to swim. We were having a great time, playing like kids would play. Being the rebel of the family, I decided to go as close as I could past the four feet mark. Suddenly, I felt something move past my left leg. I freaked out and gave a little squeal as I hopped back to the stairs by the shallow side. I stepped out of the pool and peered into the pool trying to figure out what touched my leg. That scared my two sisters, so they too came out of the pool to see what was going on. That was when my little sister Sarah realized that her bracelet was missing. She had a Hmong bracelet. In Hmong we call this bracelet Kung Tung Ba. It is a bracelet made of copper, given to her from my mom. It is meant to keep negative energies or evil spirits away, and it is not meant to be taken off. 
In the case that it does fall off, it means that an evil spirit is around. Something to note is that this copper bracelet is extremely hard to open without the help of an adult, and even then, it's still hard. My older sister Lily went back into the pool. She walked around using her feet as a guide to feel around the floor of the pool. After a few minutes, I saw her dunk down. She came back out and headed toward us. She reached out her hands, unwrapped it, and handed the bracelet to Sarah. We were shocked to find that the bracelet was completely bented open and flat. We headed back into the house to tell Pana what happened. She shrugged it off, saying that we were probably just imagining things and that maybe the copper bracelet just reacted to the chlorine. We didn't talk about it anymore after that. That night, I had a dream that we were swimming in the pool and someone dragged my leg to the deep end. I was holding onto the walls of the pool, trying to pull my body back to the shallow side of the pool. I was able to escape to my parents' house, but by the time I got there, my eyes had already turned a dark black color. When I woke up, it was already morning time. Pana sent us back home, and I told my parents what happened, including my dream. My parents are very protective of us. I know when they're scared, and in this situation, I can tell that they were. They told me to calm down and assured me that everything would be okay. Shortly after, my parents called a shaman to Hupli for my sisters and I. This event we call Hupli literally translates to calling back the spirit. It is a cultural belief that when someone gets scared, their spirit may leave their body. The objective of this event was to call back the spirits of my sisters and I in case we lost our spirits during that scare. Failure to come back with a spirit may result in sickness or worse, death. A few months have passed. I don't remember visiting the house after that incident. One morning, the phone rang. I happened to be the one to pick it up and was shocked to find that Pana was on the other line. She was hysterical and crying. I have never heard her cry that hard before. She wanted to talk to my mom, so I called my mom over and stepped away from the phone. I was far enough to not be in their business, but close enough to still hear my mom. Just a few seconds into picking up, my mom's face changed. You could totally tell that something was wrong. She told my sister to not cry and that she was going to talk to my dad and visit immediately. Later that night, we found out that Artilova passed away. He died from drowning in their pool. Apparently, he dived on the deep side, hit his head, and passed out under the water. Zilova was a tall person, maybe a good six feet. If I remember correctly, the deepest that the pool could go to was maybe eight feet. And the most disturbing part of this tragedy was that my little nephew was the one who witnessed his death. He explained, I saw uncle diving, and then he fell asleep in the water, so I sat and waited. My nephew probably waited a good 10 minutes before Pana came out when she stopped hearing the splashing of the water in the pool. She has always felt guilty for not coming out soon enough to save Zilova. My nephew also has always felt guilty for not realizing that Zilova was drowning. The Jamma event came shortly after. A Jamma event only happens when a family member passes. During this event, relatives are invited over to discuss and prepare for the funeral. One night, my parents received a call from Pana asking for red corn. In the Hmong culture, red corn is used to ward off any spirits or ghosts. It's kind of like when you use onions and garlic as a vampire repellent, but in this case, it's using red corn as a ghost repellent. Pana needed the red corn because my little nephew was complaining that Zilova was bothering him and that he didn't like it. In the Hmong culture, there's also this belief that kids who have not lost their baby teeth yet are more prone to see ghosts. We call this Chitoplinia. My mom instructed Pana to spread the red corn by the windows and doors and to say, Va, no chia ka chonyalo, ka 
thochi tsolo o ma on ging tentia ting ming dope meaning va you are already gone from this world please do not come back to cause us any sickness or trouble and with that my nephew stopped complaining about zilova Before the funeral, Pana and her husband called a shaman to look into Tilova's death because it was just so bizarre. The shaman did a ritual and reading. He found that Tilova actually missed his time to go by a few months. When Tilova and his family went to canoeing a few months back, the canoe flipped. He didn't have a life jacket on and he also could not swim. When the canoe flipped, he was supposed to drown that day, but my brother-in-law miraculously saved his life by diving in the river after him and pulling him free from whatever he got his foot stuck in. Here's the creepy part though. The shaman communicated with the river demon during the ritual and reading. The canoe was flipped by a river demon who saw Va and wanted to marry him. The river demon followed Va home and eventually found an opportunity to take him with her. She was the one who held him underwater to his death in their pool. When I heard that, I thought back to the time we were swimming in the pool after they have gone home from the canoe trip. That could have been my sisters and I. A year passed. My older sister Pana and my brother-in-law were still mourning the loss of their brother. They were also stressed from recovering from the funeral expenses and making ends meet to pay the mortgage without Vas help. They got into arguments all the time. Things just weren't the same anymore. One day, they told my parents that they were going to sell the house. My parents argued with them to not sell the house since it had a few good acres of land and they really wanted to grow crops and to farm. That house was nothing but bad memories for Pana and my brother-in-law. They refused. My parents really liked the property and felt like it would be a wasted chance for them to finally have an area to grow crops and to do some farming. They talked to Pana and eventually it was agreed that they would finish Pana's mortgage while Pana's family lived in our house back in St. Paul. Little did we know, my parents' decision would affect our family forever. We moved into Pana's house at the end of my 7th grade year. I was not happy about that decision. For one, moving to Forest Lake would mean that I would have to attend Forest Lake District schools. I was not ready to make new friends. Second, Tilova passed away at the house through drowning in their pool. I was angry at my parents for not thinking about us, but I knew I couldn't do anything about it. The decision had already been made. My family had a total of 9 people living in the house. Including me, there were 5 sisters, one brother, my parents, and grandma. Three of us, the younger sisters, shared a large room upstairs together. Everyone else basically had their own rooms. My sisters and I were all middle and high schoolers and were only about a year apart from each other. We settled in our new home. To be honest, The house made me feel lonely even though I lived with nine others and shared a room with two others. I don't ever remember a sunny day at the house. We didn't even think to use the pool after what happened. I never really felt like the house was our home. It didn't have that feeling. I always felt like it was just a house and we were living in it and that was it. I remember that summer to be the worst. I was angry all the time over nothing. I rarely saw my family. We had a hammock out in our front yard and that's where I would sit every morning and just write. I listened to the grass whistle and I felt the wind on my skin. And for whatever reason, I just felt better outside. We made it to the middle of summer. No school meant being able to do whatever we want to do. We would often stay up late. Our parents don't really yell at us for staying up late because we were pretty obedient kids anyway. It was hard to get in trouble. I remember one particular night I decided to practice playing guitar. It was probably close to 2 a.m. I was a fairly new guitar owner and took that summer to learn how to compose music on my guitar as a hobby. 
I was practicing the chorus to my song over and over again, trying to rewrite it to make it sound smooth. About an hour into my practice, my older sister Lily suddenly stopped and said, Hey, stop for a second. I looked at her as her eyebrows arched to a confused frown. I asked her, What do you want? She replied, I thought I heard something. Never mind. I continued my playing and singing. I was honestly a little annoyed because I was just in the zone and she drove me out of it by asking me to stop. Regardless, I kept going. I felt my voice becoming tired as the night grew older. All of a sudden, Lily reached her hands over to grip the strings on the neck of my guitar to stop me from playing again. Now a little agitated, I yelled, Ugh, what the heck are you doing? Shh, she said. Just listen. Now she was starting to spook me a little. I put the guitar down. I heard someone singing with you. I looked at her confused. I heard another voice singing with you, she said again, making sure I knew she was serious. Lily jokes a lot, but by her tone and facial expressions, I could tell that she was not joking with me. We looked over to my little sister, Sarah. We saw that she had her headset on and was quietly watching her Korean dramas over by her bed, undisturbed and unmoved by us. At this point, I was totally creeped out. I should have known better. Hmong folks have this superstition about not singing at night because, one, something might hear you and either bother you because it's disturbed, or two, something might want to sing with you because it thinks you're singing to it, or three, it might just simply want to follow your voice home. I decided it was time for me to sleep. We didn't tell Sarah because we didn't want to scare her. My sisters continued doing what they were doing. Lily continued reading. She wanted to wait until Sarah finished her last drama series. Now, if you watch Korean dramas, you would know that one episode may range from 45 minutes to an hour. I probably fell asleep before she was able to finish her last episode for the night. I jerked awake to find a loud shriek. It was Sarah. The room was still dark. I looked over my covers and saw Lily rushing over to the light switch. She flipped on the lights and ran over to give me an extra push to get out of bed. She waved her hands, gesturing for us to quickly follow her. I saw her panicked look and didn't question. We quietly followed each other down the stairs. Both my sisters looked terrified. We went to knock on my older sister's door. Her name is Mary. Mary turned on the lights and asked us what was going on. I shrugged. I was just as confused as she was. Lily explained, We heard a strange noise coming from the windows. It was so close to the windows that it felt like it was in our room, and we could hear it very clearly. It didn't sound like human. It didn't sound like an animal either. It sounded like a lot of voices put together. I don't even know how to mock it. Still confused, Mary invited us into her room. She took out extra blankets and pillows from her closet and began fixing a spot on the floor next to her bed for us to sleep on. We never told my parents what happened that night. They were far too concerned about building their farm and we didn't want to stress them out even more. My grandma was living with us at the time. She broke her hip bones in a fall a few years back so she can't walk anymore. She also doesn't talk too much. One night, my oldest sister living with us at the time was coming home from work. Her name is Tina. Our Forest Lake house layout is kind of interesting. Our garage is connected to our house. So when you go through the front door, you're standing in the middle level of the house. It's either you use the door to the left to get to the garage or use the stairs to either go up the stairs to the living space or downstairs to a bunch of rooms. The only people sleeping upstairs were my sisters that I shared a room with, my brother, and myself. Everyone else slept downstairs, including my grandma. Tina's room would be the first room to the right as soon as you reached the bottom of the stairs. On her way down, she thought she saw my grandma walking from one end of the hall and into her room, which was at the other end of the hall. The person walked way too fast to be my grandma. Also, my grandma couldn't even walk. 
A little weirded out, Tina went to my grandma's room to check on her. She found my grandma still snoozing away in bed. Tina went into the other rooms to see if anybody was in their rooms. No one. Everyone was upstairs in the living room. She shrugged and played it off as her eyes were just playing a trick on her. That night, we heard a scream coming from her room. It woke the whole family. My mom went in to check on her to try to figure out what was going on. Tina cried, telling my mom that she reached out her hands to get her phone by the pillow, and she felt a cold hand right before I slid away into the darkness. My dad blessed and tied a string on her neck that night. Tying a blessed string is often used as a blessing for wellness and to keep bad spirits away. A week later, my dad noticed my grandma becoming weaker. One night, he had a dream about my grandpa riding a white horse with a few deceased relatives to the house. Grandpa explained that he was there to pick up my grandma. My grandpa is not alive anymore. He died in Laos before I was born. I want to note that in the Hmong culture, when you see a white horse in your dreams, it most likely has to do with death. Because of that dream, my dad grew concerned that my grandma will not be able to live past the evening. My dad called important relatives and family members of my grandma to come to our house. It may possibly be their last time seeing my grandma alive. I remember my sibling and I gathered outside of my grandma's room while we watched relative after relative entered her room to say their goodbyes. I remember us laughing and joking about how silly my grandma was as an attempt to try to comfort each other and then crying because we knew that she did not have much time to be our grandma. My grandma always wanted to pass away in her home, and we made her as comfortable as we could, and my dad held her the whole time. That night, my grandma passed away. Two questions lingered in my mind since my grandma's death. Could it be that the voices my sisters heard were my grandpa and the relative spirits? Could it be that the person Tina saw was my grandpa's spirit entering my grandma's room? I don't know, and honestly, I don't really want to find out. This house, the same house that Zilova died in, the same house that my grandma died in, it didn't even feel like our house anymore. After my grandma's death, there was a big empty space that no one knew how to fill. I continued sitting outside in our hammock every morning, writing and revising lyrics. Each morning that would be my routine until my parents would ask my siblings and I to go pick vegetables from our garden for lunch. We owned a good sized property. My parents loved gardening. We planted everything from flowers to cherry tomatoes. My parents also raised chickens. We probably had a few hundreds of them, I couldn't count anymore. My dad built a large chicken coop to lock them in at night in case we had wild cats roaming around since we lived near the woods. I would say the chicken coop was pretty secured. Not only did it have a 10-foot fencing that surrounded the coop so that the chickens would not be able to jump out, the coop itself had a door that was able to close from the outside by using these strings to tie together and secure it into place. Inside the coop were different rooms for the chicken to stay in. Each had a door that could also close. One day, my dad noticed two of his chickens by the 10-foot fence outside of the coop. The chicken's bodies were ripped open as if someone had clawed through it and ate it. My dad checked the coop. The door was tied closed just like how he had left it the night before. He didn't think too much about it. He figured the two chickens didn't make it to the coop the night before and a wild cat probably mauled them. He tossed the chicken and continued his day at the fields. At night, he thought he would just double check to make sure that all the chickens were in. The next day, he noticed again two chickens dead by the 10-foot gate and this time outside of the coop. My dad swore that he locked all of the chickens in there's absolutely no way that the chicken coop door was open. It was still tied the exact way that my dad tied it the night before. 
My dad knew that it could not have been an animal. Animals would not be able to untie knots to open doors. And even if they figured out how to untie the knots, they would not be able to tie it back up. My dad immediately thought that maybe it was the neighbors trying to send a message. We unfortunately lived by a neighbor who didn't really bond with people of color. He hated that sometimes we would let our chickens roam and they would appear in his property. My dad decided that maybe it was time to get a lock. That day, he worked on securing a lock by the 10-foot fencing and the main chicken coop door. That should do it, he thought. Proud of his work, he left that evening feeling confident and kind of bad for the neighbor that was going to travel that far to a locked door. The next day, my dad went to check on the chickens. His heart dropped when he saw once again two chickens dead by the 10-foot gate outside of the chicken coop. He then said out loud, Whatever you are, you are not welcome here. These are my chickens and my food for my family. You are not allowed to steal from this property. He suspected that something spiritual or paranormal was happening. The activity at the chicken coop stopped after my dad said those words, but then he started to get sick. At first, he had a really bad cold that I remember lasted a few days. We made him chicken tofu broth with rice. He had what looked like shingles, but refused to pay a visit to the hospital. You know how older Hmong folks are when it comes to sickness and hospitals, they would rather seek Hmong herbal medicines and shamans. My mom was an herbalist. She knew all types of different herbs that were good for different types of illnesses. She often bathed my dad in some type of medicinal leaves and roots. My dad had burns and bumps all over his body and chest. He complained of pain all the time. It was sad to watch because we couldn't do anything to relieve his pain. Because he was sick, we had lots of relatives visiting. It's pretty universal across cultures to visit a sick loved one just to see how they are doing and if they can help in any way. I had cousins that came by and stayed the night. They were more intrigued by the chickens than anything, so that's where they hung out most of the time. One night, they were out late by the chicken coop. I think they were trying to lock the chickens away for the night. By this time, the sun would have already set and it would have been dark. My family and I were waiting in the house and setting the table for dinner. All of a sudden, you could hear all three of them screaming and running in the direction of our house. My mom was the first to poke her head out of the porch door to see what was going on. My cousins finally got to us out of breath. My mom questioned why they were screaming. The oldest cousin finally caught his breath and explained that they saw someone crouching by the chicken coop door while they were locking the outer gate. It didn't show its face, but they could make out its bluish skin and elongated facial structure. He explained that it didn't seem like a human and it had a very dark presence. The cousins left the next day in the morning. I'm pretty sure they were spooked. My dad has been sick for a few weeks now and not getting any better. He still refused to see a doctor or even visit a small clinic for treatment. Since my dad has become sick, my siblings and I took up a lot of the chores around the house. One of them was feeding the chickens. It was actually my favorite chore to do because it was easy and the chickens act like my little puppies when they follow me for food. We have five big 100 pound chicken feed for our chickens. My dad always liked being prepared and doing less trips to the market since everything was so far away. It was my little brother's day to feed the chicken. We usually keep the chicken feed locked inside of our greenhouse. During the time, I was at the garden for my mom watering her acres and acres of land. My brother ran up to my mom and I to ask where the chicken feed was. I told him that it should be in the greenhouse right by the door. My brother told us he didn't see any. I was a little annoyed because my brother can sometimes be a lazy prick. I decided to go with him just to prove that he was just being lazy. 
We got to the greenhouse. I look over to where the chicken feed usually is and was shocked to find that my little brother was telling the truth. The chicken feed wasn't there anymore. I found myself trapped in my mind for a few seconds trying to figure out what the heck happened to the chicken feed. There were five bags. Five bags don't just disappear. They are also very heavy. My dad could not have moved it because he was unwell. My mom also could not have moved it because she was always at the garden and could not have done it by herself. I don't think any of my siblings would move it because we were still young and didn't have any muscles to do it honestly. My brother and I walked back to the garden to ask my mom if she had moved the chicken feed. She shook her head no and said that she will go check after she's done watering her plants. I told my brother to go home. I finished watering the plants with my mom. We both walked back to the greenhouse together. The chicken feed was not there. My mom gave a puzzled look as she started to walk around the greenhouse to see if someone placed it in a different area. Our greenhouse was pretty organized for the most part. There weren't clutters that could hide things. She didn't search for long. My mom decided to give the chicken cooked rice with water that night as a substitute. It has now been about a month and my dad is still not well. My parents decided to bring in a shaman. My mom needed to prep for that ritual. In the garage, we have this storage area that looks kind of like a loft. It was connected to a set of stairs that would take you up there. My mom kept some of her plant seeds and herbal medicines up there. She wanted to get some seeds and herbal roots to pack and gift them for the shaman. As she was looking through her stuff, she noticed something out of place. The five chicken feed bags that went missing appeared up in the loft. This was strange because our garage and greenhouse was always locked. Both places are also far from each other. Who would have the time and strength to carry five bags of feed from the greenhouse all the way to the garage and up the staircase to the lofted area? It didn't make sense. It was convenient that the shaman was there. My mom asked the shaman to also look into that situation. The shaman performed her rituals. Her performance took less than two hours. Her readings found that there is this witch spirit who lives in the mound on our land. At the mention of the mound, we looked at each other knowing exactly what the shaman was talking about. She was talking about the oddly placed mound in the middle of our anchors of land. I've always thought it was a strange thing that it was there, but my parents never thought to destroy it. My dad had dug a hole underneath the mound to hide his valuables, such as passed down antiques. The witch who lived there didn't like that my dad was disturbing her peace and destroying her home. She released her rage on him and wants him to remove his items. Upon hearing this, my mom mentioned that she had a dream about my grandma. In the dream, my grandma came and scolded my mom for her to keep my dad away from the farm and for us to get out of that house. It was a warning that my mom dismissed thinking that it was just a dream. Seeing the seriousness of this situation, my parents decided that we were going to move back to St. Paul. By the end of that summer, we packed up our belongings and left for good. My dad got better almost instantly and we never looked back. Thank you for listening to Mix in the Dark. I am your host, Mai Ying. Mix in the Dark is available on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast series. If you have a story that you would like to share, please send it to mixinthedark at gmail.com. If there's a story that you really enjoyed, feel free to hit up my tip jar on Venmo. Just search Mix in the Dark on the business tab.